What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Bonsai Mirai. I'm Ryan Neal, the purveyor of this fine institution, Mirai Live, an online educational platform, Mirai Mobile, a bonsai guide and educational bonsai app. And we're about ready to dig into our forum QA where members of our live streaming platform and educational offerings provide their trees and allow us to give insight into design, horticulture, and all manner of bonsai aspects and bonsai related ideas. If you'd like to try this out, join for free. Subscribe at live.bonsaimirai.com. Be a part of our community, advance your bonsai skills, and dig into the art of bonsai. Beginner, intermediate, or advanced, we will make you better and allow you to further enjoy this beautiful and wonderful, mysterious art of playing with tiny trees and putting them in tiny pots. And if that doesn't get you, nothing will. Without further ado, let's dig in to the forum QA. First up, James C. Uh, Blackthorn, Prunus spinosa, collected 20 years ago. Uh, last scope, minor pruning in the spring of 2023, located in the UK. I bought this tree four years ago and have continued to try and improve the ramification. I'm now at a crossroads in how to move it forward. The tree is obviously a very traditional broom style and I'm unsure if I will continue to push the tree in this direction. I would encourage you not. I think the tree has some issues that would need to be improved. Lower branch on the left in the picture question mark, I see. Okay. Uh, I think this will need to be cut back and regrown to improve the overall broom shape. However, I'm not sure if a more natural styling would be something to consider. I'd really appreciate your thoughts on how you'd progress the tree. The tree is due to be repotted this spring. My plan would be to then let the tree recover until next spring, but I wanted to consider the pot and planting angle now. Your thoughts on a final pot would also be incredibly helpful. Picture one is the front, two is the left side, three is the right side, and four is the back. Okay, so I see your draw, certainly, understandably, to image number one, you've got the deadwood uh, and sort of the broader base, but here's what I notice when I look at this. You know, in any time, a great base uh, from the front or the back, we've got a, a great base and a stable base. I would say that your choice on the front has that foreground dead root dimension, so I agree with that. But when I look at the left and the right side of this tree, I'm, there, there's something here in terms of stability and potential, particularly when I look at the left side of the tree. You've got some fantastic rootage. There's still some deadwood in here. Uh, but the bigger, the bigger thing that I see is notice the change in direction. Now, this does not mean, see all of these changes in direction? This doesn't mean that that's what we go with. Okay, if you're resigned or, or accepting of the front, and let me just make sure that I'm... Yeah, boy, I think you might have an opportunity to move. Okay, if you're accepting of the front as it is, Prunus spinosa is a very freeform tree that can take on some radical contours in terms of the styling and composition. And I think that the overall globular dome shape of the quote unquote broom, this doesn't actually satisfy the traditional broom model because the traditional broom model is, 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 a, is a straight trunk that then moves out. And you really have an informal upright tree here that has a very symmetrical canopy. Prunus spinosa offers you the ability to really move in an asymmetrical direction in terms of generating a more interesting and older aesthetic inside of the tree. And I'm gonna say from the reading the description, I already said, listen, I would not pursue the broom form. And I'm gonna say, I, I really want to push you, even, even if we slightly move to the left side uh, of the tree and we start to look at our front potentially from like over here, where we pick up on what we see as an extreme version of that looking directly from the left side, right? And so these, and let me just see here, no, this is, this is the right side of the tree, excuse me, this is the right side of the tree, yes, third is the right side of the tree, so let me go back here. Let me come back to here. And I'm actually saying, I think you have potential, James, to be looking at this tree from, from somewhere over in this region. Now, you've got this gin. You say that gin's going to poke you in the face. Could be correct. Is the gin more valuable than the movement that you get from starting to look slightly to the right side and changing that angle just slightly? And let me go back here and start to say, let me just orient. Okay, so we've got the big branch on the right side. The big branch on the right side from your current front 
is literally sticking out here at three o'clock. It's not engaging the viewer. Meanwhile, the branch on the left side is coming out virtually at six o'clock, meaning it's pushing your viewing window already over to the right side. This is intuitive, right? We want those branches on left and right to engage you at the four o'clock, five o'clock, at the seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Embrace the viewer with your branching arrangement. If we start to shift towards that right side a little bit to take advantage of the movement, now all of a sudden, the branch on the right starts to engage the viewer. It actually puts you in a better viewing window with your structure as it currently exists. And I think this kind of starts the process. Now, you have a firm anchor root here, which means you can push your asymmetry to the right, which when I start to see that, I'm saying, if I'm gonna make any adjustments to this tree, I'm gonna be looking at the adjustments coming from a reduction over here, potentially. I also wanna break up this, this formal billow into the informal billow, right? Your apex, your high point is already off here. I love that, let's keep that. But if we drop this down to an informal billow here and then we push out to a defining branch on the right side, really reducing the left side of this tree to pull in on the left, push out on the right, you've got the asymmetry in your high point, we break that formal billow into informal billows, I think you automatically start engaging a higher level of aesthetic, okay? Simple moves, easy to talk about, tougher to do. You're looking to prune back this left side to buds or branches and these elongated pieces. Notice these buds that exist in here. I'm gonna cut right here. I don't wanna lose, I don't wanna cut back primary branching and regrow primary branching. That's, that's basically two steps backward, two steps forward. We're not into that, right? We go two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back with our broadleaf to eventually in that 10 year process get to that finished piece. This tree is well on its way. You have the capacity to drop crotch prune, save your bifurcation, prune back to these interior buds, lose this exterior in a lot of these regions that are overly robust and contributing to that formal billow. You get the informal billows, you get movement in the crown, you already have the asymmetry, you've got a wonderful tree here. If this gin needs to be adjusted because it's poking you in the face, you can break it off and shorten it and I think you have a much better tree. Now, in terms of a container, I'm not mad at the rectangle. You've got a powerful tree here, and I think when you start to pick up on some of this angular movement from the right side, it's gonna further justify the rectangle, but the rectangle is rigid, and that's where I think a rectangle that has a rounded corner could be a really, really nice uh, change of the container to be able to engage. I think you could probably reduce the left to right width. Now this comes down to form uh, and function. Can you water this in a smaller container to maximize the aesthetic? Maybe you say, listen, that's not really an option. I work all day. It's enough as it is in this container to keep it watered. This is clearly a highly ramified tree, a lot of leaf mass, a lot of water mo mobility potential. But if you could go with a slightly reduced container left to right, you're gonna make the tree look larger. It comes down to whether you can care for it. Either way, I think you soften the rectangle, rounded corners, angle to the wall. Notice this is a straight wall, sharp corner. Little too hard for this tree that although it has the power, still has very curvaceous lines compared to other blackthorn that exist out there. I think that slight adjustment would be absolutely magnificent. I'm not mad at all at the color. I love this bottom sort of decrease. You've got the depth that gives a flowering, fruiting, sheen-based broadleaf tree the kind of horticultural health and care that it needs to continue the flowering and fruiting process. The way that you get away with disguising that depth is this lower or middle. This almost gets to a middle ornamentation, which decreases the visual appearance of depth. Whatever you do, whether you have another container that looks like this, or maybe you have a band in the middle of the pot that breaks up that depth and that long expanse, that middle ornamentation is going to be imperative in your container selection to maximize this tree. But this is a spectacular tree at a very far state of development and we don't wanna take it back to the beginning. So the pruning needs to be accurate and concise with intention to create the informal billow and break up that informality. I love it, I can't wait to see the adjustments. I think you can prune this and repot it because you're not doing the major, major prune. I think you could prune it and then repot it, never repot and then prune. Prune and then repot, I think you're good to go in terms of having the ability to adjust this tree's aesthetic as well as its container in the spring season. Okay, Evan O, 
Ryan, greatly appreciated your feedback last week. Made me glad to hold off on making any cuts to the tree before getting your input. I had two local bonsai professionals with hand saws and hand in hand at my last workshop when I picked the tree up. I do want to get some more insight from you on this tree. I'm running anything I do to the tree by the owner prior to doing it unless I decide one way or the other on purchasing. I told him I'd like to continue working with the tree throughout the growing season before making a decision. At the very least, it's a great opportunity to work with some more established and refined material. Species Trident, location, Columbus, Mississippi, issues. We've covered the mistletoe already, planning to do the repot with the owner in the next couple weeks. I'd like to get your thoughts on design and handling of the tree over the rest of the year. It looks to me to be in refinement with the majority of the primary and secondary structure well established. There are some big stump cuts that need to be worked, however. Will the scope of work for this tree just be energy balancing and refinement pruning? Do you see any opportunities to adjust the design? Photo description, one is the current front, two is the back, three is the left, and four is the top down. Okay, so certainly, uh, coming back in, grinding these down to the collar, uh, rewounding that living tissue, and then pasting that with the puttied cut paste is going to be absolutely imperative. Now, when I look at the overall structure of the tree, the biggest thing that I see in all of the other images besides the front is the fact that these two trees are relatively close in terms of their height. Um, and this tree at the very top, this is an odd run without branches here, okay? And you have so many branches up in here coming from the same regions that it's causing that to really thicken and swell in that upper portion. Notice here how gigantic this is. I think there's an opportunity to potentially look at reducing right here, cutting out that big knob and that top. You have the ability to regrow kind of an apex here, add a little bit of movement, work this out into here, which allows you to start to build this informal billow. You start to ramify here, which allows you to really work on that informal billow. But one of the bigger things I could see is taking one of these longer branches, if you have the length, and thread grafting through this midsection of this trunk to be able to get branches in this upper quadrant here that allow you to start to fill in some of the gaps that exist inside of the design. I would also go as far as saying, hey, listen, if this is your number one trunk because it's the most dominant, we want to be really careful because this has so many branches at the top, it's causing this to thicken and catch up to the thickness here. And that hierarchy of thickness to height, this secondary trunk needs to stay thinner than the primary trunk, OK? So in thread grafting into this middle, we're adding more branches. We're already going to reduce the branching load here, which will help maintain that hierarchy. I would not hesitate to thread graft as long as we're not going opposite of a branch here. I would not hesitate to thread graft a branch into the foreground here to start to build some informal billow that gives you some depth and does push this into the background of the front. I still agree with this as the current front. I think although the trunk is fairly straight, we don't really get away from that straightness in any of the other perspectives that the tree offers. But that height and that proportional ratio of height is so very important. I'm looking in 2D. I'm looking from the right side of the tree here. I'm looking at you know, this sort of very large area with a conglomeration of branches and saying, hey, can we adjust here and potentially go to here? Now that I'm looking from the right side, does that work to lower the height that exists here and come back to here as your apex? There needs to be a move to reduce the height and the branching and maintain that thickness and that hierarchy. I think your initial front is the correct front. I think it's the best base. And I think we correct that secondary trunk to really match our objectives. And I think you're well on your way to dramatically improving this tree, OK? Danielle, hey, yo, Ryan and crew and forum peeps. What's up, Danielle? Thanks for the reassuring words with the California juniper. If it takes off, let's go. I'm ready for this for its next step. When I started down this rabbit hole two and a half years ago, I would never have imagined this is where I would be with my abilities. Wow. You put in the time, you put in the work. This is what happens, Danielle. It's kudos to you and your efforts. This week, another sweet find from the corner of my favorite nursery species, Cirsus occidentalis, western redbud. Ooh, I love Cirsus. I've got one in the making right now. Time and training one week. Last scope, repotted 213 from a 15-gallon nursery pot. Location, uh, Orange County. Whoop, whoop. Uh, issues, concerns, none. Kill it or make it a bonsai. Agreed. This is the time coming out of a big container. You got to go big. Found this while killing time, walking around my favorite nursery. Removing it from nursery soil was easy as the tree must have been significantly and recently up potted with no roots occupying any soil past one third the way down the pot. That's a good find. 
As I was working on the shape of the tree pruning, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of the tree I wanted to keep and kept telling myself, don't hack and whack what, what the tree already is giving me. Correct, I like that, good restraint. This will be a beautiful tree. I just have a couple questions regarding future development. I'm pretty stoked for the pot flower combo. By the way, it's a wood fired pot. Cool, let me just take a look at what we have here. Yeah, the base says it all, hey? Um, and this looks almost like maybe it came from England, kind of a, uh, is this an Aaron ceramic from England? I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, maybe, maybe not. Super graceful lines in terms of uh, what it has to offer. Picture one, there's a blue hour pointing to a really straight branch that I've contemplated shortening or removing, okay. Uh, it is on a branch I wired forward to the viewer, making it the more dominant leader. I gave it some clockwise rotation with a forward bend, but that one inside branch still boggles me in the way of design. Thoughts? I'm in no rush with it, and I can stay as long as I'm uncertain. It can stay. It's fairly bendy, oak-like feeling, but comes off the primary at a 90-degree angle. Any other design thoughts overall? I'd like to keep it curvy and feminine-ish. Agreed. This is a very, very uh, beautiful, slender, uh, smooth trunked, limited scarred tree, and we want to keep it that way. So let's be very considerate. Uh, pick one, cheers with a morning beer and a day off. Good on you. Uh, proposed front and blue arrow pointing to the straight branch. Picture two. Two other branches I removed for structural purposes. Okay, I definitely agree with those. Pick three, left and right view, and pick four, uh, back and front before wire. Okay. So I see the branch that you're pointing at here. And let me just say, OK, we put wire on this tree. We carried this in here. We've got this coming here, Danielle. You've got to reconcile this area right here. OK, that's first and foremost. Second, if it's the picture angle because you're close up to the tree that's causing these two primary lines to overlap right here, so be it. You step back, you have the space, great. But that space between those two primary lines is of paramount importance. And the way that those spaces engage is very, very important, right? So my suggestion to you, even if you step back and you can see a slight space there, we still have this space to reconcile. I'm almost thinking you don't need to close the gap here. You've got a great acute angle. Where we need to really kind of work at this is to increase this move so that it bows and we don't cause this inward movement that creates that circular shape, but we push this out, right? I think this blue arrowed branch, yes, it comes off at almost a 90. The way that you improve that, put wire on it, bring it up, close that angle, and get that up and out here. That's how you're going to be able to reconcile that. But the bigger issue beyond that branch is this secondary trunk here and its relation to the primary trunk. That's where I would suggest that you consider some wire that allows you to manipulate this and to push this out and follow that parallel line so that we create harmony and we open up that closed circle to create that acute crotch that leads to these two trunks kind of mirroring each other as they move up into the tree. That's my critique. I'm excited for you to see the flowers on this Western Redbud. Unbelievable. Gary, come on, Gary. Hi, Ryan. This is a Hollywood juniper that I have been neglecting. It was repotted from nursery stock four years ago. It's been healthy with water percolation issues, telling me it is time for a second repot this spring. I did a poor job on the initial styling, going for a three apex form, but not really following through and neglecting the tree last year. The trunk looks fairly perpendicular to the pot. How would you change the potting angle and advance the design? How should I sequence the potting versus the styling? What is the plan for the timing and the remaining work? What kind of pot would you recommend? Okay, yeah, fairly per perpendicular. perpendicular. Uh, if, yeah, so this must be, okay, Gary. When I look at this, the first picture, or excuse me, the second picture that you give me, I think is from the left side of the tree based on the orientation of the trunk. I'm assuming this is the front that we see in picture number three. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, you have this perpendicular angle of origination here. And let me just go into the close up and take a look at that. You have a nice Nabari. You've clearly identified that this is the best base. And when I start to look at this, if this is in fact the best front, I've got my strongest root on the left side here. If my strongest root is on the left side here, then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change the angle here to get that root and take that tree off of perpendicular leaning to the left. Now, let's go back to the second image, which is your front. 
Okay, now that we're leaning to the left on this here, I think that this tree probably needs its apical region right up in here. I think this is too, too long and too sort of out of context for the tree. I think you gin this, right, which could be really interesting. You're already leaning, and I'm going to go a little bit more to the left here. You're already leaning to the left in terms of this tree's handling. Now, there's an exception to the rule here if you decide that you want to elongate the proportions and make this a more feminine tree. If this is going to be a more feminine tree, then we go ahead, we take advantage of the movement that exists here, and I think you go ahead and add some really interesting movement to the top of the tree and bring this up. You don't have the base to handle this kind of shift in direction necessarily. Bringing that apex not over the base, but back and then carrying it out into that harmonious direction, or if we're gonna lean on that heavy root, bringing it to the left across the trunk and carrying it continuously to the left, now you have the ability to bring your apex here, your branches here, and that starts to cue the rest of your design. Now, I think the multiple apices approach is still the right approach. I think you carry this here. I think you have this apice here. If you have another apice down in here, I think you want that leaning in that direction as well. And if you're gonna go with a more elegant design, I think you have to get rid of a lot of these lower branches. You could keep these very short and have a nice little pad here. You could gin some of these elongated pieces. You could bring some of these finer branches down. But to pursue utilizing this apex, which now that I'm getting into it, I'm gonna say is the best use of this material, I think that you probably do reduce a lot of this lower branching, strategically pick the smaller branches that are gonna keep your silhouette narrow, give them that downward movement that creates that look of a very elongated juniper with that narrow silhouette to show that elegant feminine detail. And when you start to do this, Gary, I'm thinking a round container is actually better. As long as that apex breaks the lateral boundary of that round container, which starts to formulate your criteria for width and size of that round container, I think you have something really, really interesting here. Interesting lip, nice flare on that wall. You want stability, so we're gonna have good contact on the bottom of the container. The world is your oyster once you start getting into this elongated, uh, elegant design. That's where I would go with the tree in terms of executing the highest level of what it has to offer. Max, hello Ryan, here's a pine that I showed you two times before, species Sylvestris, two and a half years in training, uh, first styling April 2023, location Germany, was just there actually, I was just in Germany, first time in Germany, loved it. Uh, issues, concerns, as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of fungus in the pot, the drainage holes are occupied by fungus, I never saw this before, how should I deal with this situation? The tree sits in the container for two years now. Uh, with the styling I tried to follow your advice, do you have any comments on the design? Should it be improved in the next styling round? Thanks a lot, Max. Okay, so let's first look. So there's my concept. Uh-huh. 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 Got it? Yes. Okay. All right, so first and foremost, fungus. Uh, pines with their very coarse root system have to engage in the mycorrhizal relationship with beneficial fungi in the container. The, the white stuff that I'm seeing is a product of that mycorrhizal relationship as well as a product of winter conditions. If they're clogging the drainage hole, you really have no choice but to repot this tree to clean that up into free percolation, not only of water, but also air permeability that moves through to give you that balance. Most of us feel like, oh man, with pines, we wanna see all that mycorrhiza. Great, but there is a point where there's too much fungal activity in the container, water can't escape the container, balance of water and oxygen is thrown off, and we start to really have uh, a less than desirable result. We actually have too much fungal activity in several of our pines in the garden, and we've had to repot them to correct that issue. This is a younger tree that has the ability to rapidly produce roots and that fungal symbiotic relationship. I think this tree is saying, hey, Max, if water's not moving through my container, I need you to repot me. And I would say that is definitely something to look at, okay? So just recognizing that there is the opportunity to have too much 
uh, of that fungal occupation when you get too much and it impedes water percolation and oxygen flow, we've got to do something about it and help the tree out. It's not doing anything wrong. It's doing what it needs to do, but it's in a confined environment and it can't control. When it starts to rage with the fungus and they're getting along beautifully, sometimes that's counterproductive for the containerized environment and we've got to make adjustments. Young tree, we can repot more rapidly. It will calm down over time. You'll find that balance. But in this current iteration of a healthy tree in a small pot and it's clogging the drainage holes, which I can only see the surface, I'm saying, hey, Max, is water still moving freely? If it's not, we got to repot, okay? Loss of percolation, one of the three reasons that we repot, okay? As far as the design, what I gave you here is I really wanted to take this straight section out of the tree and I wanted to push the apex as far as possible, okay? So when we come down here, this one to me looks as though the apex is rigidly straight, perpendicular to the rim of the container. That's a no-no, okay? So we automatically understand we've got to adjust some things. When I look here, this was more the selection of the front that we were thinking about. I'm less concerned because this has this slight angle, but I would love, I would still love to get this apex over into this direction as we sort of pointed out here, right? So that adjustment of that line to come over into that right side a little bit further, I feel like that is how you maximize the quality of this tree over time, okay? Now, the interesting thing is when I look at this initial piece, I don't have uh, the same abundance of dominant branches on the left side here. This tree is clearly grown and evolved. And now look at how powerful this branch going to the back is in terms of left side, which basically zeroes out your branching. Now, we recognize pines are built, not created. First iterations do tend to have more symmetry in them. If this is a process of keeping this foliage to build the back buds, that eventually allows you to have a smaller branch on this side and push out with length on the right side, so be it, we'll accept the symmetry. But if you say, well, I could move this to the back a little bit, I might get a little bit of a peekaboo here. I might be able to reduce some of this length to create that space. I might be able to drop this down a little bit more. Uh, and the adjustment of the branching gets you that kind of accommodation of the design, then I would say that's what we need to do to continue to evolve and improve the shape. Ultimately though, when you bend this over, I think your apex almost starts to come from right here and maybe this overly elongated top needs to come off of the tree. That is a decision you can make because this is easily compactable. If we start to change that line, maybe we can still use this apex. But for the girth of the trunk, the width of the silhouette, and the height of the tree, the trunk cannot support this visual mass. So we either need to compress or reduce some of that upper structure to get that greater asymmetrical push. And again, if these pieces are being saved to build back budding, pines are, create, are built, not created, then we need to build first, get what we want, and then reduce. You can decide where you're at in terms of this operation, but I think there's a little bit more of a push to maximize the design of this tree with that element on the left and the height of that trunk and that push to the right of that trunk line to maximize the quality of line. Let me know if you need any further help, Max. Joe, Pinus parviflora, uh, Tanima no Yuki, time and training, none acquired as nursery stock last summer, last scope, repotted two weeks ago, location Boston. Issues, follow up from two QAs ago, you gave me some design advice from before the repot, and obviously your advice pick included was without having any idea what was under the soil. So when I sat down and introduced myself to the tree, hi, I'm Joe, good job, Joe. I hope that was a good formal introduction, and started to learn about Tanimi no Yuki, number one, I ended up coming out with what I thought was the best front and potting angle, and then I started to get worried because it wasn't in the direction you suggested. So I was curious for some feedback on how I did objectively selecting. Finally, based on where the tree is now, how would you change, how would this change your previous design concept? I have my own concept on where I can take it from here, but ultimately hearing yours will continue to help me with reinforcing the bonsai styling process in my own practice. Nice, I hope you saw that lecture, I'm assuming you did. P.S. The bonsai styling, ah, here we go. Bonsai styling process lecture might be the most useful and powerful piece of bonsai content I have ever digested. Watched it four times already. Joe, nice. I find that process to be so imperative and undefined. And so I'm glad that you used it. I'm so happy it was valuable. I think it's something everybody needed. Uh, and that means a lot that you gave me that feedback. So thank you, Joe. Um, ah, yeah, I love this. Okay, so we changed the slant to the right, which you did. Um, 
And did we keep the same front? Change the front a little bit. Gotcha. OK. And I'm not sure if picture number two is your front or picture number three is your front. But if picture number two is your front, I'm into it. I'm into it big time, right? And I feel like that dominant branch on the right gives you everything that you need. The trunk line is defined now in this change of orientation. And I'm really liking what you did here, Joe, uh, if image number two is your front. If image number three is your front, which I think image number three coincides with the angle here and the design that we had initially conceptualized, I think you made the right choice by going with image number two. And again, even if this is, even if you're like, ah, oh, shoot, image number three is my front. Image number two, I was just showing you post repot on the heat mat. Okay, so be it. I think image number two is the best now that we see the planting angle. You've got the root anchoring the movement. We're coming here. I see this little jog. This is your apical region. This piece drops down now, uh, potentially in this deep pot, maybe even drops down significantly into a semi cascading form, right? Drop the kids off at school. You've got some interior branching right here and here, and then you get to the tip here. Those pieces can actually be moved back up in here to create this to drop the kids off at school. And then I think you want to move your apex, compressing because you have a powerful base. It's too long and elongated. So you take that, you compress that here. Now we move into this. We drop down into here. Uh, I think you can have a counter branch. I feel like this might be opposing your primary branch, which means this would ultimately need to go. We could drop this piece down. You've got buds you want to cultivate in here, which we need to get these to 50% of the tip before we cut that off. Or take off this piece here, use this better piece that's more highly ramified, tighter, and more compact, which may look like this as a branch, but that's OK. Right? That's OK. And maybe this other piece moves to the back, and we get this sort of depth piece here. And all of a sudden, we're off and running where we start to establish this type of a design. I think that's the best solution design-wise to what we got out of the repot. And I love the gesture of the tree from image number two. I think that's where you got to go in terms of progressing the design capacity of the tree. Um, but again, I'm so happy that design process lecture was of value to you, Joe. And again, I find that to be a mispractice, misunderstood, and lowly discussed component uh, of bonsai that uh, just felt like it needed to happen. Andrew, species parrot's beak, Gmelina philippensis. That's a tough one. I wonder if that's a silent G. Anyways, time and training one year, last scope, pruning to keep elongation in check. This puts on insane growth in a few months. OK, so let me just say this. If it puts on insane growth in a few months, partial defoliation and pruning of a broadleaf to get multiple sets of ramification in a year, by saying it puts on insane growth, you now have the obligation of evolving this tree very quickly. OK, so I'm just going to put that back on you. And I'm going to say, all right, well, then we should see this thing radically improve with that insane growth, which is the case for most tropicals. And if this is from the Philippines with the Philippensis, uh, uh, Latin name, then this is a tropical, subtropical tree that we should be able to really crank out uh, multiple sets of ramification in a single, singular year. Uh, location, Virginia, zone 7A. Issues, concerns, curling leaves. Hey, Ryan and Mariah team, what's up? Uh, I have a health question and design question for this tree. Being a tropical plant, I brought it inside for the winter, and this year I decided to invest in a grow tent for my tropicals. I'd give myself a solid B on my utilization and understanding of the tent this year, but everyone made it through alive, so I'll take it. Cool, good. First time is always tough. However, since moving this into the tent, it dropped a lot of its leaves. I was not co too concerned, as I know many tropicals can be fussy when moving them. It regrew all the leaves, but they all came out curled and have remained that way all winter. Many of the leaves are also sticky and often have dew. I do not see any signs of pest, and the leaves are healthy, aside from the curling. I'm unsure of the cause and hope you might have some advice. I would consider taking up testing with apical, but being a small tree with small leaves, I don't know if I could get enough leaves without fully defoliating. For the design question, I'll keep this short. I let the one shoot at the base grow as a sacrifice to help the base of the trunk thicken. I'm now wondering if keeping it helps add interest to the otherwise straight primary trunk. I will reduce the height of course to fit within the hierarchy of the other trunks if I end up keeping it. What do you think? Image one is currently the envisioned front. Image two and three are other angles. Ooh, 
Oh, daddy like that. Uh, three, okay, not so much. And, uh, and image four, a close-up of the leaves. Okay. So, um, thanks, Andrew. All right, here we go. Listen, any time that you see cupping of the leaves, and I'm going to say any time as in 95% of the time, right? So there's that 5% that's something else. It's a nutrient-related issue, okay? And typically, the nutrient-related issue is a calcium deficiency. Um, one of the best things, if you're dealing with an alkaline uh, water source, right, which a majority of North America, a majority of the world deals with alkaline water sources, then we typically have a really good capacity to apply calcium via the use of BioGold. BioGold has 13% calcium. It's the highest calcium resource fertilizer that exists on the market. It's why BioGold is so effective. And as long as you're in an alkaline water region, meaning your pH is above sort of that 6, 7, you're in the, 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 the 6, 7, 6, 8, 7, 7, 2, 7, 5, BioGold is a great way to get calcium on the tree. Without that acidity, BioGold doesn't release a lot of its magnesium and the metal contents that it has, and, it's, and it can be a wonderful bonsai fertilizer methodology, okay? So maybe that is something that we need to invest in to try and reconcile what does appear to be a calcium deficiency. Now, the sticky substance and dew is concerning because typically this does only come with some sort of insect presence. Have you looked at it under a little magnifying glass to see if there are microscopic insects that are working on it because there's really no reason for a plant to be producing sticky substances uh, on the leaves. And the curling may be deformation with the presence of a microscopic insect. Areified mites would be one insect that typically attack uh, different species of trees, but we primarily see distortion in pine needles with the areified mites, and they are microscopic. You need a lens to be able to see those. I would invest more closely with the presence of the dew and the cupping of the leaves before I apply a fertilizer to make sure this isn't an insect cause, because deformation from insects feeding on the leaves is a very common occurrence, and you have the dew present that suggests that there is something happening here that is beyond just the nutrient content of the tree. If we're not able to find those, we still have to get to the source of why do we have dew on the tree? Is this a product or a part of the species? I would look that up and see if you can find information. I'm not familiar with this particular species, but it's hard to believe that there would be a dew forming that creates uh, any sort of sticky substance on the leaves without insects. That would be a very rare form of the tree or a very rare physiological behavior without some sort of impediment. And if there are, are no insects, I would say calcium is probably your solution to the cupping of the leaves. Now let's go back to design, because I got to say, yes, we have an interesting root here coming out and circling around, but it's also bisected by this very symmetrical central root, and we've got a weak side to this root base. Now, very rarely would I go away from a more dominant root base, but our trunk is very, very uh, cylindrical and straight here. And when I go to image number two, I have that root presenting a much stronger sort of buttress to anchor that asymmetry. You've got a little bit, it's still straight, but the swelling, the shoulder placement, the presence of the branching make it appear as though there is more movement on this side, okay? I, I would push you in this direction. I'm seeing it in two dimensions. Take it with a grain of salt, but I personally find image number two to give you the counter to the asymmetry that gives you the capacity with a slightly better trunk movement that gives you a more interesting tree. And I think your objective now, Andrew, has got to be defining your line base to tip. Now, this appears to be the one we cut this short. We want to be carrying this out into this direction. Now, this is a fairly short squat tree, which means we can broaden the canopy here and start to create an informal billow. You've got this as your defining branch here. This is your defining branch, which means we need to be generating these different pad pieces that allow us to build informal billows and give us that directional insinuation. Okay, when we get into these areas, I want to be keeping this nice and short. This is a depth branch here. We can drop the kids off at school and divide that to create proportion and perspective. This piece coming out of what appears to be a similar junction, we may need to make a decision. And if you've got depth over here that can give us that background, we can take this out without fear. And in taking this out, guess what we give ourselves the ability to do? We've got this guy here. I would love to close this crotch to be more acute if possible. I don't want to get to perpendicular. That's a no-no. 
But if we get this in here, we separate this here to stop the swelling, we start to build off of this piece here as a continuation where we can build this out into this region, come up with an informal billow that we're compressing here. We're gonna move to the left here. We satisfy that secondary trunk hierarchy of height and girth, and you're off and running in terms of the design. I love, uh, I love where this could go. Simple material with a good solid design foundation builds a beautiful bonsai. And this has the resources, the tools, and the branching structure to be a really, really great tree just from simple application of design concept. Okay, you've got multiple flushes that you can balance the energy, stimulate more ramification over a multitude of times across the season. I think you've got all the makings of a really good tree in this piece, and uh, hopefully that gives you the guidance that you need to get there. Okay, Darlene. Hello, Mariah. Hello, Darlene. This is my Larex Camphorae Dwarf Blue, which was nursery stock in 2017 in a one-gallon pot. Oh, score on the nursery stock. Very healthy, no concerns. I just started a second wiring. It is very compact. I've been directionally pruning and doing branch selection as well. My question is, how do I deal with the end of it? Should I chop it back a little bit or keep, keep the length as is? Design critiques, welcome. Wiring critiques, not. I'm learning. Good, fair enough. Uh, and it actually looks really pretty good, Darlene. Uh, pick one is the front. Pick two is the back. Pick three is from above. And pick four is a close-up of the end. OK. Um, so first and foremost, this was a piece of nursery stock. Of course, we're six years in, which just goes to show you what happens when you dedicate time. You cannot buy time unless you're buying a tree that has, uh, that has experienced time. And this tree is starting to show some really great age with the work that you've done, Darlene. I'm like super psyched and impressed on this. Now, let me just... Let's just dig in here in terms of how do we handle it, compact, you know, pruning, wiring. Your wiring looks good, same angle, same spacing, no gaps. Uh, I, like, uh, I like your combos. Like, it looks like you're on the right track. Keep building your skills and working on that. I won't spend any more time on the wiring. But when I look at your design and I look at the front here, okay, one of the things that I see is I, I lack some degree of clarity in the design from the way that some of these lines are kind of overlapping each other here, if you notice that. Now watch what happens when I go to image number two. The clarity of the lines where there's less overlap, still a little bit, but less overlap, allows me to see the space between your pads. And this space, the defined region of positive and negative space is so important uh, in terms of bonsai creation. Now I see a wind and form tree here by the, the shape and the structure of your trunk line. I see the presence of roots. Soil is eroding a little bit away from this base and I would love to raise the soil level. Let me get rid of that. I would love to raise the soil level to hide some of that negative space. Now maybe there's a bigger base down below this. Larch will self layer, which means they will produce roots and that could have happened in a nursery container. And there may be an even bigger base down below this. I don't know, you would have to explore that if the trunk gets smaller below these roots. Let's assume that these are your nabari and we wanna raise that soil level just to create that solid base. But when I look at your tree, and I'm going to focus on this backside just because I have the negative space to kind of work with here, you've got this sort of up and out, up and out, up and out movement. And I think that the length here actually helps you. Now, I think that's the length that exists inside of your primary structure of your trunk and the branches that emerge from the trunk. And I think that's the length that exists inside of some of these secondaries. Where you're at now, before this pushes growth this spring, is pruning back to two buds on all of your tertiaries to start to control the length. You could potentially shorten to a structural branch and maybe take off this big wild end here because we are starting to get far enough out in this design that this base and the girth of this trunk doesn't necessarily support this length right here. So, you know, chopping it back, I think, is a little bit of a crude term for where this tree exists. exists. Shortening the length of the defining branch uh, I think could be very, very fortuitous for the design and start to create the proportion that you're looking for. 
uh, bringing these branches up above the structure here, creating the space that's giving you this clarity, or down below the structure to create the space and that clarity. And if you're pushing to the right side here, this is the back side, I know I'll come back to the front, then really focusing on reducing the length of these pieces on the left side, compressing on the left, elongating on the right, or we come back here and we say, you know, from here, maybe we do shorten this elongated piece here, maybe this piece takes over as the leader and we shorten those tertiaries back to two buds so that we start to get this kind of formation here, right? That sets you up to have this piece over here. This is beautifully defined here. This piece kind of drops down and then you drop the kids off at school at this branch and we start to form these more larch-like pads here. This piece has clarity and rises above this piece below it and kind of forms almost like an apical region. This piece sort of exists in the back here. That's kind of what we're looking for to really start to define uh, the further investment into the shape of this tree. Um, so the chopping back, I would say, is just a reduction of length back to a really beautiful piece of ramification. You could even gin a little stub here as if it was broken off. And then really focusing on holding back this right side and maybe even looking to reduce this right side all the way back to a branch where we get some radical movement here that starts to work with the flow of the tree moving to the left. I think that's really really how I would recommend moving forward with this tree. The fruits of the time that you've put into a tree that probably started out as humble nursery stock and is now starting to evolve with age is awesome though. Stay on the path, you're doing a great job, and I think you are ready for that step of regaining proportion and starting to refine the pads that you formed over the course of time. Andy, Juniperus horizontalis, let's take a look. Ooh, la la. I remember this tree, seven years in training, just wired and repotted, Pacific Northwest. Hello, my team, slightly off topic, but bristlecone pine number three and quaking aspen number two are captivating. Awesome, thank you, I love that. Anytime, uh, listen, I would rather somebody love it or hate it, but not be ambivalent to it. If somebody can walk by a Mirai tree, it means we failed. We did not try hard enough because even a dislike for design means somebody had to invest time in looking at it and you know, dislike oftentimes, if the craft is in the work, uh, hopefully gives rise to a new concept. You know, like if somebody hates the work and it sticks in their mind because the level of craft and detail and technique and artistry that's put into that piece sticks in, sometimes that grows into something positive and they say, oh, now I understand that two or three years later, or that image gives rise to a piece of material that they see where they say, oh my gosh, that's why you did that thing. Turns out Ryan might know what he's doing, right? So uh, I appreciate that bristlecone pine number three and quaking aspen number two caught your attention. Sorry, back to this topic. I'd like your critique on this work, please. I'll ask that you excuse the two wires crossing the trunk line. No worries. Give you all the lenience you need. Um, it was an accident due to the strong bias of the front positioning I was used to. It's difficult to be objective, and I often have to keep pulling myself back. Just so you know, I have to slightly up pot my trees, and the left structural root was pointing vertically, so I wired it down. Thanks for teaching me how to do cool stuff like this. Absolutely. Photo description one and two, messing with the light. Okay, I got you. Yeah, look at that. I like that little box. Look at that Mariah box right there. That beautiful pine cone, Ponderosa pine, my native state. Uh, three and four old pictures. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, dramatic transformation, dramatic transformation here. Um, and I think you know, first and foremost, we recognize the perpendicular orientation. We recognize this is going down, and this is sort of sitting here saying, what am I going to be? There's a tree here. There's a tree here. But this and this were a disparity. And so we got to this, which is just lovely. Angle to the trunk, uh, apex, engaging your defining branch, compress on the left, elongate on the right. I love what you've done here. I think this is fantastic. Now, if you asked a traditionalist, what would they do with this? They'd say, oh, you got to shorten this branch here. And maybe they would even shorten it to here. Or some people would say, cut this branch off. Listen, if you cut this branch off, you take away uh, this piece on the left side that you've compressed. 
you turn this into a regular old symmetrical tree, right? In leaving that length, it can always be shortened in the future. It can always be turned into a gin. You can invest in the creativity or we can continue to extend as long as these pads stay small. This could extend because we have the base, because we have the trunk set up, because we've got all of this engagement here. This could go on forever and still be proportionally accurate to the design. I think this is a dramatic, dramatic improvement. Super psyched to see this kind of evolution of your, of your bone size sense. Uh, I'm, I'm all for what you're doing. Now, how would we continue to evolve this design, right? This is always the challenge after we execute something and have that kind of success, how do we continue to evolve it? First and foremost, defining branches here we don't want to elongate this piece, okay? The out in out, that's the value. This gives us depth. Keeping this compressed is going to be of paramount importance. If you are going to continue this evolution, this piece can grow, okay? This piece can grow, it can extend. The high point of your apex has the ability to continue to move. What you're gonna see in the future is that this apex will probably overgrow the proportion of the tree. You may choose to gin it, you may choose to gin one side of it, and your apex starts to take on that asymmetry. You may choose to get rid of this altogether, and then this piece becomes your, your apical region working with this branch. You may choose to go ahead and gin this as this gets bigger and bigger and start to use some of these depth branches in here. You may choose to reduce the live vein on the inside of this and have deadwood running up the trunk. That gives it more age as it thickens, evolves, and develops. These are all the ways that you could continue to enhance this tree as it responds and grows on the design that you've created. It's always necessary. You don't have to chart the path. You don't have to memorize what could be done because each time you sit with this tree, you're gonna make it the best it can possibly be. We want this tree to really beach ball out, give you more ramification to create more intricate and detailed pads. It's gonna fill the container. The growth is gonna tighten. You're gonna get more ramification. Inner nodes are gonna shrink. That alone on the design that you have is going to be a better and better bonsai. But when you get to that point where it's outgrown the proportions, right? This is where we start, start to say, okay, these are the options for that next step. And I think you've got a very bright future based on the bones that you've created in what I think is, is a radical improvement to the design of the tree, okay? Nice job, Andy. Gregor, hello, Ryan, for today and Olive. Uh, time and training. Now, I have no picks here. Time and training, 15 years. Last scope, repotted 2019. Location, Europe, zone five. Uh, questions. How do I wake up a tree? The olive lost all its leaves after a cold event two years ago. The scratch test is positive ever since. Light green tissue beneath the bark. However, the tree is not producing any leaves. Is there any technique to stimulate new foliage? As always, thank you. Okay, here we go. So when we start to talk about how do I wake a tree up, and I'm just gonna go ahead and take that off. How do I wake a tree up? The scratch test is telling you tree is viable. The only way that we get leaves is for the tree to produce roots with the stored energy that still exists. And it says it still exists because the branch is still green when you scratch it. So we start to say, okay, how do you promote root growth? Balance of water and oxygen. You shouldn't be watering this tree a lot unless it's utilizing water, which would suggest it's building its root mass, which would suggest that that root mass, once it's built enough to sustain or to add growth, you will see leaves pop. Two years later, it's still green, it's still viable. Focus on that balance of water and oxygen. It's the only thing that you can really do to try and get a tree over that hump to potentially pop. And I can tell you that olives can stay two or three years without foliar mass and start to grow. So can grapes, so can redwoods. There are a number of very vascularly powerful trees that have this capacity. If it's still green, there's still hope. Balance water and oxygen, balance water and oxygen, balance water and oxygen. Without roots, leaves will not occur, okay? Uh, Zachary K, let's see what you got here, Zachary. I had this pulled up. Okay, very good. Species RMJ, time and training, none. Collected in August. Last scope, none. Location, Denver. Issues. Thanks to you and Mariah team for everything you do. American Bones, I would be so lost without you guys guiding us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. When I came back from Japan, I thought, man, the ceiling on the potential of bonsai in North America is literally infinite because we've got the, in my mind, the best collectible trees in the world. 
People would aspire to the Sabina junipers, the Sylvestris, and the Mugos of Europe, or the Shimpaku, the white pine, the black pine of Japan. I say, listen, the Rocky Mountain juniper, the Ponderosa, the Lodgepole, the Limber, the Bristlecone, uh, the Utah juniper, the California juniper, the plethora of broadleaf deciduous and broadleaf evergreen that exist, we have absolute capacity, redwoods, I mean, you know, top to bottom, we've got the capacity with the material. That just means we've got to amass the technique. And uh, that was our goal to democratize the technique. And we've done our best to do so while keeping the lights on. I collected this tree in September. It was growing in a natural rock bowl that allowed me to connect, con excuse me, collect the entire root ball with no cutting. I broke up some of the mountain soil and lightly teased and cut back some of the root ball. I felt like the natural rock pocket act like, acted like a training pot. It has a very condensed and developed root system, so I went straight into a bonsai pot with a 111 instead of a grow box. It is still sitting in a pumice heat bed with other collected trees. Also, I didn't select a front or think about styling, just put the tree in a pot based on roots. Few questions. Should I repot it into a pumice grow box or wait and see how the tree does in the current situation? It has had a lot of foliage turned back to green from its reddish winter coloring, so it seems to be going forward health-wise. And styling advice, what do you see the potential front as being? Should one of the split trunks become a gin? I think it has some interesting nabari, a cool gin and neat shari, but definitely needs a styling overhaul. Thanks again to you and the team for working so hard to bring much needed information to the masses and inspiring so many of us to work harder as well. Best wishes. Thank you for those kind words, Zachary. That means a lot. You, you actually don't even know how much that means. Um, first and foremost, uh, you had a small root system, went straight into a bonsai pot. I've had this happen three times in my bonsai career. Uh, it just so happens that you jumped into it and had this happen in one of, you know, I don't know how many trees you've had or how many times you've collected, but, you know, I'm assuming this is early on in your bonsai process. Uh, and it's rare, but you know what? You want the container to accommodate the root system. If it fit, it fit. Don't take it out now, though. The green is coming back. The winter color is fading. This tells me that the tree is, is doing just fine. Balance of water and oxygen, appropriate watering, that's where your focus needs to be. We need to let this tree establish, okay? You need to see vigorous tip elongation. If we're not seeing elongating spikes, then the tree is not ready for any sort of work. But as I look at it, we've got a good base in picture number one with some interesting movement. Picture number two, I see that deadwood, which looks to be very interesting. I also see what appears to be uh, some trunk movement, and it looks like this is where it separates into two trunks. I don't have the clarity here. When I look at image number three, there's a tremendous amount of foliage in the way, and I look at image number four. It's still a little tough, but I do see the split right here where we've got a solid base that splits into two. I think ultimately, and I'm telling you, Zachary, if you jump the gun on this and you go at this tree and start reducing foliage and making gin and styling it, uh, this was, let me just make sure I understand here, collected in August. It hasn't even been in a container for a year. You're going to watch this tree rapidly fade. Okay, you got to show patience. This tree needs at least two years. Okay, so you're looking at fall of 2025 as the first possible time that you could style this. Good horticulture is what you're looking for right now, but okay, and I run the risk of giving you something that's going to get you excited before the tree is ready. I probably see this piece becoming really radical gin, and I probably see and again, it's tough to tell because these branches are in the way. I probably see this piece as being your best uh, option and opportunity. Looks like you have a natural transition here that maybe forms an apex. Looks like a branch here could potentially drop down. This could be turned into a full-blown piece of deadwood here. Maybe some of that deadwood extends down the trunk. If this is a little branch that comes off the bottom of this, maybe we leave that as living tissue. If it's coming off of this, maybe we carry it into this space. You've got branches back in here for depth. There's a lot here to work with. Let's get this tree to a point where it's recovered and healthy. I think this is just, again, not being able to see much, a rough idea to give you a vision of where this could head over the course of time. But right now, Zachary, patience is your technique. Uh, balance of water and oxygen is your technique. Let's get this tree strong, robust, producing spiking, elongating tips, and then let's see what happens once this tree's fully recovered. You may see one of the two live veins shed. Things might not pan out the way that you think, and we're gonna take what we have left, or this tree might just crush, and you're like, I got total opportunity, and this is one direction that we could potentially head. All right, thank you again for the kind words. Ryan C. Olive. Almost a year since I've had it, possibly in training for two to four years prior, last scope, repot performed in 219, location San Diego, no concerns. 
Hi, Ryan and Ride team. I'm super happy with how the repot went with this tree. I was in a training pot prior. It was in a training pot prior. Is it possible to reduce leaf size with this type of olive by partially defoliating? If so, how long should I wait to perform this action? Also, how would you increase the ramification while keeping it shoheen size? Thanks so much. I always appreciate your feedback. You got it. Front, picture one, two, back, three, side, four, prior to repot. Okay, yeah, nice, nice. Nice transition, nice work. Um, and let me just kind of work through this here. Okay, so uh, is it possible to, and this was repotted 2-19-2024, so just repotted uh, recently. Uh, after repot, we have to see this tree explode with growth. The next time you could potentially touch this tree is in the warmer portion of this summer. Olives as a broadleaf evergreen, broadleaf evergreens really needing to be handled before trees turn the corner towards fall dormancy because they, we don't want them growing in the fall. We don't want to reduce their leaf mass when they're accumulating vascular resources over the fall. So we're looking at sort of late July, early August as the first time you could engage with this olive. But if it's not producing radically elongating branches, branches, then we're not going to be touching it. We're going to let it recover, fill the pot, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, when I look at this, you don't want to be partially defoliating and pruning until you've wired the tree out because the wiring is what distributes the hormones. The partial defoliation and pruning is what balances the energy across the tree and stimulates the tree to produce ramified, smaller, finer branches at the crotch of the leaves that we do cut down by two thirds to that one third 30% left of the leaf mass, sugar starch suppression, and now all of a sudden we get ramification as the manner in which the tree adds the foliar mass it needs. Okay, I see this as having a standard olive kind of growth habit here. So maybe we plan to have a, a, an informal billow here. These lateral branches being brought up into these regions. I'm gonna create informal billows. Some of these can come down. When they come down, they must come back up as a broadleaf tree to maintain strength. This piece may be moving out into here. Maybe we take this piece and move it out into here. And all of a sudden, we have this kind of uh, style to the tree, okay? But we've got to put the wire on before we do any pruning. We can't do any wiring or pruning until we get aggressive growth. And that aggressive growth has to repay vascular tissue, i.e. in the form of roots, before we start taking away its photosynthetic ability that if we take it away too soon, it doesn't regrow roots. We impair the energy system and the tree limps along. Okay, so patience. Uh, I'm going to echo what I said to, to Zachary. Patience is the technique. Balance of water and oxygen is the technique. The soonest we could touch this is sort of in that latter portion of midsummer to the beginning portion of that late summer period of time, end of July, early August. And we need to see vigorous growth before we pursue that work. Michael S. This is a grafted dwarf eastern white pine you've seen before. Since the last time it lost some branches and now has only two branches coming off the trunk. Time and training, five years. Last scope recently wired, no issues. Pit Pittsburgh zone 6A. Please critique. Chosen front, picture one, two right, three back, ooh la la, and four to the side. Okay, let me just see the roots over here, got it. Okay, let's play here. All right, so super funky, lovely, lovely, odd sort of tree here with this very sort of playful um, trunk line, and I just adore the funkiness of this, okay? Um, immediate, immediate uh, speakable impressions. I don't yeah. Okay, there's something happening here. And when I say there's something happening here, I'm drawn to I'm drawn to your back instead of your front. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why. And this is I don't hear bonsai professionals quantify their opinions beyond I like this better than that. But why am I drawn? Why when I looked at image number one, I said, okay. I looked at image number three, I said, yes. Okay, and here's where this exists in terms of design. 
we have a perpendicular emergence here. I'm not even that worried about it because in all actuality, the negative space of that goes like this and we're past perpendicular. So we can go ahead and negate any necessity to try and like change that. We don't need to, okay? I like what you did with the potting angle. I rescind it. I don't see a perpendicular line. I'm coming up here. I have good movement, but I'm obstructed right here. I'm obstructed right here. Okay, obstructed from what? I'm obstructed from seeing the extent of the trunk line. Why does that matter? Because this is a literati form of a tree. If it's a literati form of a tree, the farthest degree of feminine elegant design, we want to see the totality and the entirety of that trunk line to maximize its aesthetic beauty, okay? So I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a slender trunk that's long enough to give us the literati opportunity but I'm seeing it handled in a way that covers that trunk and masks the visibility of that trunk as if I'm trying to create a moderate sort of in the middle of masculine feminine, that big gray area that a lot of bonsai material sits in. I'm accommodating that gray area when I'm actually handling a piece of material that demands full visibility. And so when I sneak over here, First of all, I get a smaller canopy because I'm seeing the backside of these branches, which gives me less visual mass of the foliage. But more than anything, I've got this full expanse of this trunk line that's visible. And I'm saying, well, that is what this trunk needs to maximize its design, okay? Now, I think you have almost equivalent features on both sides. This has a really interesting presentation, has an also interesting presentation here. Base is great on both sides. Maybe this side is better. It's a little darker and harder to see. But I am noticing a very significant amount of foliar mass on a tree that's very slender from here, whereas it feels a little sparser here. I'm seeing more of the trunk line here. These are things that you cue into and you start to say, okay, that's how I adjust this for the better. Okay, now, there's another thing to comment on. Highest structural element should be your apex. This is the highest structural element. And it's been handled as a branch and our apex has been brought up from a lower structural element, okay? Is that, uh, is that taboo? Mm, we have a funky root here that we accept and embrace the, the weirdness of it. Do I feel like this and the informality of this very long cylindrical trunk and this odd jagged gin, do I accept that? I actually think that that might enhance the visual interest of this tree, right? And it's inside of these weird moments where you have to know the rules to break them. Michael, I don't know that you know that you've done something wrong that is actually right here. And so I wanna be very careful to say I accept this because that is not carte blanche to use your highest structural element as a branch and bring the apex up from a lower structural element. But if you knew that you can't do that and you intentionally did this, then I would say, well, that's a really interesting artistic choice. And for this tree, I think it works beautifully, okay? So I need to be very careful here because 99 times out of 100, this is a no-go that completely destroys the design of a tree and makes it a tree that will not improve with time. To use the highest structural element as a branch and a lower structural element as the continuation of your trunk line and apex, 99 out of 100, no go. This happens to be the one out of 100 and one of the only trees that I've seen recently that I think works because of the funkiness of the material and the, the, the oddity of these elements that somehow work that you can pull off this kind of funk and be rewarded for it, but I like it. I like it a lot, okay? You have to decide. Is image number three gonna become your new front because the structure and everything works towards the literati form, form more? Or are you gonna adjust image number one because there are more redeemable characteristics from image number one for the better tree that you're seeing in three dimensions that I can't see because of the darkness at the base and the, and the two dimensional limitation here? I think that's where the further improvement of this tree can be considered. But if image number one is gonna be your front, you're gonna to have to reconcile how massive that foyer mass is and how you deal with the shape of this that's forming here, okay? Uh, but image number three is very compelling to me just based on what I can see in two dimensions. I'm gonna leave that in your hands. You've already gotten this far. I think it's funky as hell and I like it. Don't abuse what made this special by doing this to every tree because they will have 99 failures out of 100. But you got the one success point, use it as a learning tool, and let's figure out how to create that literati vibe in a way that's intentional and gives this tree more merit, okay? 
I feel like that was a very encouraging but stern talking to. And in no way do I want to, you know, it's always interesting. I have a lot of students that have a lot of creative concepts. And when you see somebody come up with something that creatively works but breaks the rules, that's a fine line to walk as a teacher trying to give my students the ability to intentionally create the best bonsai. Uh, and I feel like we had to confront that here. So hopefully you got the positivity in the message and also the warning sign that you've done something that you shouldn't do, but it worked. All right, Gary, Cryptomeria, time and training, eight years, last scope, wiring last spring, Long Island issues, some loss of primaries last season. Ryan, last year was not a good year for the larger tree. It didn't grow much and lost a few primary branches. While observing the tree, I noticed areas of the Nabari that were void of substrate. I chopsticked in with appropriate substrate when I recognized in spring summer. Both trees appear very healthy now. I'm not happy with the position in the pot and was wondering what you would do from here. Would you let it ride or repot in 2025? 20, from my next repot, would you change pot? Would you change potting angle and position in pot? Thanks, Gary. Okay, so let me just take a look. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that sucks when we lose primaries, especially on Cryptomeria. There's such a such a monster. Uh, okay. Um, I am not happy with the position in the pot. Okay, here's what I would say about this, Gary. I like the position in the pot. I think if you're going to have these trees in this pot, an oval pot feels totally applicable. I think the relationship foreground, background, Nice acute relationship here, uh, trees parallel each other, thicker tree, higher tree, thinner tree, lower tree. I mean, like all, all of the functional things are working for you. Um, what I would say could be improved if you were going to do so, and you've got to weigh this out because this is a conifer, and when you start to separate conifers that have been planted together, you're going to significantly impair the roots between these two trees. It's not bad as it is. Do we want to look over here and reduce the distance between these two? That's possible, and that would require a rotation that's far more minimal. Or do you want to separate these trees so that you can actually close the gap between these two and have this, and have this crotch be more like this, where these two trees sit close together? If we try to break it down, I see an equivalent spacing on the right side as I see between these two trunks. And if you really want to break it down, you actually probably have double that. So this spacing equals this spacing, and this is almost exactly double. So we've achieved a degree of, a, uh, of symmetry in terms of the spacing on the right side to the between the trees, and then double that to the left side, which anytime we start to work, if you're not working in rule of thirds, and you're working in rule of halves and quarters, things start to become really visually challenging and we can't quite figure out why. I think that's probably why. I think the rotation is the lower lift. I don't know what that does to all of the character and quality of the trees. Um, but as far as continuing to advance this material, I think you've done a great job of creating a narrow silhouette that gives these a vertical impression. But I want more of this, right? I want. Cryptomeria and upright trees, redwoods and cryptomeria, uh, really benefit from abstractly long branches. Okay? It doesn't have to be disproportionately long, but abstractly long branches that give you just a sensation. Uh, when I take this away, notice that you've got equidistance here. Notice that you've got equidistance here, basically. right? So you've got a square outer silhouette based on the length of your branches. Now, maybe the rotation helps that, or maybe we need to grow out just that little bit of defining branch in the upper portion of the tree, having a little bit more presence in terms of the design, keeping these lower portions slightly shorter. And I don't know that I would reduce this one so much as elongate this one. And I think you have a much different expression 
taking away that straight line that exists on the exterior of both silhouettes, but I think the proportion of spacing here is also a major issue that with a slight rotation and a little bit of consideration of this spacing to this spacing and how that reverberates in this spacing, you'll be able to capture the right position and the right selection of the front that will mitigate a lot of the things that you don't like about this tree. My two cents, tough in, the, in two dimensions, but also at the same time, sometimes an image, a two dimensional image takes away all the three-dimensional obscurity and allows you to see exactly what's going on here. And I think that's a big part of what you might not like about this composition. Camille, oh yes, the larch is back. Hey guys, sorry for being out lately. Let's get lost in the vortex again. Amen, good to have you back, Camille. Uh, species Larix decidua, my 2020 Yamadori in the first training pot, pretty coarse particles. Last scope, wire removed and guy wires instead in some places, summer 2023, location the check. Back with this baby larch, baby beluga maybe. Uh, last spring, primary and some secondary branches were wired, let it grow freely after summer wire removal. Now I basically need help with pruning decisions, particularly how to decide how long I need primary, secondary, and so on to interact with each other uh, on a design basis. Question, should I leave this primary branch longer? Should I leave this primary branch longer? Mm. Or should I shorten to the first or to the first two secondaries? Okay, let me see, primary branch. God, this is a fantastic freaking tree. Okay, I remember these. Uh, 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 uh. Should I shorten all possible branches where there is an opportunity to use the next higher order degree of branches, where does it apply and where not, lower portion or apex. For these purposes of marking, I enclose the last two, not much saying pictures. Please help me to get some kind of flow in it. Then I guess I will be able to wire it at my best. Happy repotting race, everybody, amen. The race is on. Okay, so we're looking at former pictures and I still find this to be the most valuable uh, design direction, Camille. I know that, um, that there was sort of this kind of return here that we had toyed with, and um, you know, it felt like it felt like we were here, you know, we had this, we had this, but we wanted to shorten this. Okay, so let's just see where we're at. So now where we're at is we still have that big long branch on the bottom. Apex, gotcha, okay. So when I start to look at this, I gotta be honest, inside of the curve here, this branch is still here. I think you gin this thing or cut it off flush and clean. I think I would probably uh, clean up these areas. These big long pieces don't add a tremendous amount of value. These short bifurcated stumps do. So I would be breaking this back and saving some of these pieces as the deadwood to clean up the busyness here. Okay, when I start to look at what we have uh, happening in the rest, I'm just getting those out of the way, uh, your, your apex and the way that this is all worked out, this is, this is radical, okay? And when you get up into this area, Camille, you've got to start to figure out is, is again, is this the continuation? Because if it is, then these branches kind of get wired down like this and we cut those back to two to start those bifurcating, okay? Keep your, Keep your apex small when you start to build, okay? These pieces come down. We're gonna be using the length that gets this proportional. That, that proportion is gonna be set here, and this branch needs to drop down. Boom, okay, drop the kids off at school. We bring up, and then we drop down again. We leave this one coming off of this upper piece here. I'm gonna keep this small. These long branches, I'm gonna shorten here so that I just get a little bit of bifurcation, cut those back to two, start to build this kind of a piece. This piece that runs down, even though it's thinner, I'm gonna have that be longer. I'm gonna have some of these pieces, these branches get dropped off at school here. I'm gonna cut those back relatively short to start the bifurcation that forms my triangular pads. And I might be elongating this longer piece to get out into a sustainable position. All right, same thing here. You've got to define your line base to tip. Wherever your apex is over here, this is awfully long in this direction. Do we have branches back in here? Could we gin this piece, utilize these pieces to start to form an apical region with a little bit of this counter piece? Uh, I would be shortening these pieces over here. I want these pads in tight. Compress on the right, elongate on the left, and you're gonna to start to gain better proportion 
having a piece right in here, we drop one of those down, we have one of these pieces coming up, we cut it back to two, we start to build this, we start to build these pieces, and then we start to be in here where we build here, we drop these pieces down, we can drop the kids off at school to create more complex branching pads that give proportion to our design. The continued evolution of this piece is going to hinge on when you drop this piece off at school and you start to form these outer branches, you're really kind of referencing what's happening down here in terms of size and length, what's happening in here in terms of size and length. Ultimately, our apex should be here, right? And we start to continue, start to continue, we continue to improve on these primary lines. You are not done yet. You have only started in one wiring. Larch takes a long time to start to cultivate and grow these pieces out. I think you're looking at something like this as the continual evolution of this piece. I've got a field grown larch that looks very similar that I've continued to evolve. We tackled that tree on the stream. You've seen its evolution aesthetically. And I'm gonna be working on larches this Friday on the live stream uh, from the workshop. If you want to tune in, I'll further enhance your knowledge of that length selection. That's where I would go, Camille. I think that's a super spectacular piece of material. Good luck with its continued progression. Bernardo, some kind of juniper. Looks like a percumbens to me. Time and training, two to three years. Last scope styled one week ago. Location, northern Mexico. Issues, I may have overdone the pruning. Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, questions, would love to get some design critique on my initial version for this tree and where you see it going in the future. You got it. Hey, Ryan and Mariah Crew. First of all, I usually have trouble telling apart all the different kinds of junipers in my collection, so I'll just say this is some type of juniper, juniper percumbens. A week ago, I put it on a turntable in hopes to make something of it. I started doing the work cleaning and doing some branch selection while keeping the long cascading branch intact. I have this tendency to leave any primary branches that have a possibility to become the main trunk intact, and last time I worked on it, I left, on which pay I left it on which paid off. Hmm. This time around, the longer I spent time with the tree, the more that branch called to me. By the time I had decided to go with it, I got too excited and decided to practice gin with my previous main trunk and didn't realize all the foliage I removed from it until I excitedly shared a picture with my brother, who just replied something along the lines of, oh wow, he removed a lot. Oh, <laughs> that's tough. I know that, the runaway train, right? I'd like to get your thoughts on the direction and whether my tree is in danger from too much pruning. I'm making sure to leave the soil a bit more on the dry side than usual to make up for the reduced solar panels on it. Good horticultural ad adaptation, I like that. My other question is if I should wire all those branches to be more horizontal since most are droopy because of their position when the branch was cascading. I suspect it might strain it even more than I have already, so I held up on it but wanted to get your thoughts on that. Also, is it okay to do work on trees in two or three sessions a week or so apart while in season? On In two or three sessions a week or so apart while in season. For example, wiring those primary branches one or two weeks after heavy branch selection and main trunk wiring. Uh, P.S. I love the styling lecture. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and enthusiasm for Boneside Bernardo. Awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad the, the process worked for you. We have been talking about that in other posts. If you haven't seen them, I felt like that was a very uh, poignant lecture to, to be applied. Uh, picks one and two are before. Let me just take a look here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, picks three and four are my new design with two angles of the selected front. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, 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 got it, great. Okay, got it, all right. Um, so let's just tackle the question of do we do these scopes of work, you know, one or two weeks apart? <sighs> I think if that's what time allows and it takes the time to, to do the major pruning and gen creation and then it's bedtime or, you, you know, you've got obligations and then you get back to it the next weekend, is that a bad thing? No, I think you're totally fine. Let's make sure that, you know, one week in between works doesn't turn into one or two months in between work because that's bad and we don't want to let that happen, right? You have very narrow windows to be doing this work uh, when the tree is at the right physiological state, state of health, foliar mass, uh, energy positive, uh, and you have a limited amount of time to be able to prune and wire so that you redistribute the hormones and the tree has the right signal to move forward with balanced energy between the pruning and, and wiring process. So you don't want to let too much time elapse. Having said that, is a week a deal breaker? Not at all. Is a month a deal breaker? Absolutely. You now have, have gotten off uh, to creating significant imbalance that is difficult to pull back, okay? So hopefully that helps. Now, 
when I look at this, the difference between, so first and foremost, I think that this is uh, a change for the better for this tree. I absolutely support uh, the design that you have pursued, getting rid of the cascading branch because you had a tree pulling itself in two directions. You had to decide on one unless you were gonna bring this piece all the way over here. You went with a longer design with this piece, which means the cascading branch wouldn't have worked anyways. I like what you did, okay? So we're here now. Um, when I look at this, I want to know, do I have the base to support this continual degree of asymmetry, okay? Because if I don't have the presence here, we're moving very far away from the base of the trunk. And if we need, because of a lack of presence of a strong root here, to pull this tree back, it's literally as simple as just coming back in here, right? And building back potentially into a tension-based design because you've chosen to leave this down here. Now, maybe this stays, maybe this goes. I don't really know, but I'm just going to respond to what I'm seeing, okay? So um, I wouldn't wire these branches up. Go ahead and let this recover. Come back to this after junipers have pushed their growth, hardened off, and you're in a season down in Mexico that is not so substantially hot that wiring it would, would cause it to suffer, and we can do the appropriate fine wiring and let the tree in an energy-positive state have the benefit of the environment working with it to give it the best response to that wiring. Maybe that's in the early, mid, latter portion of fall. Maybe you have some sort of uh, depending on where you are in Mexico, monsoon type season that allows you to do this in a June type of uh, period of time. I don't know. You're going to have to accommodate that. But you don't want to be wiring this in the middle of August if you are as hot as most portions of Mexico are because the tree will suffer greatly. Okay. In terms of the front selection, the reason that this front is appealing to us is we see the spacing in the gin here. And that's very important because that becomes a feature of a tree. The reason that image number two has a slight draw is because we foreshorten the length of this lateral movement and we get a little bit of wiggle right through that area there, okay? Notice the length of that and notice the looser curves here, right? Very, very soft, loose curve. Notice when we get here, tighter curve because that length is foreshortened. Now, if, if front number two gives you the best base, we lose the spacing here in your deadwood. It does push this branch off of being in front of the viewer and we foreshorten the lateral distance here. I think that's a benefit to the tree, okay? Uh, I would sacrifice this for this plus this. Two positives for one negative. Guess what? This wins out, okay? But it depends on where you're headed, depends on what the root base looks like, depends on the quality of the root base from this one versus uh, this piece right here. That's how you objectively make the correct decision. And guess what? In this one, if you just swing this forward a little bit and then swing it back, you foreshorten that line anyways, you get the best of this. I don't know what you do with this. That's another thing to consider. Those are all the ways that we weigh out which is the best solution and option to go with. All right, good luck, Bernardo. Clint, lodgepole pine time and training just started. Uh, last scope, repot and styled one week ago. Uh-oh, Pacific Northwest Zone 8A may have done too much. Critique requested. Oh man, collected lodgepole pine styled and repotted at the same time. Clint, if your technique is absolutely impeccable, I would still say you went too far, but let's just see what we got here. Hey, Ryan and Rye crew, I just purchased this tree from a nursery. Been at the nursery for six years in the same pot. They got it from a person that collected it from the east slopes of the Cascade. I brought the tree home, repotted it, and couldn't resist doing an initial styling after the repot, Clint. No, baby, no, no, no. Let's see how we did. I did both in the same week. <coughs> I knew I had to repot because the container was biodegradable and falling apart. That's a problem. The repot was pretty straightforward. It had a small root ball I kept over 50% intact without disturbing. During the restyle, I only pruned off a couple small branches. I wanted to keep as much foliage as possible so the tree could regain strength. However, I did bend the hell out of the poor thing. Please critique the initial styling. I believe I will end up removing the old apex of the tree rather than having that last bend that takes it back upwards, the final leg of the S-turn. I'm not sure if I do this, it will probably happen a year down the road. Final question, in your opinion, did I do too much? And if so, is there anything I can do now other than the normal repot aftercare? Pictures one is before styling. Pictures two is the front after styling. Picture three is the front deadwood. Picture four is the right side. Ooh, this is interesting. View of old and new apex. Thanks, Clint. Okay, all right, Clint. 
clank, 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 clank. Here's the deal. <sighs> okay, this is like the this is like the literati uh, eastern white pine that we talked about, where the highest structural element became a branch and an apex was brought up from here. And I said, look, 99 times out of 100, you don't do that. This is the one time you get away with it. Okay, 99 times out of 100. You do not style a conifer and repot it in the same go. It's just kind of a no-no, especially an older collected tree, which this is not an ancient lodgepole pine, but let's be very clear, it's not a spring chicken either. This is an old tree, okay? So let's just establish 99 times out of 100, you don't do that. In that one time out of 100 that you do do that, you got to style first and then do the repot, right? Because you repotted, small root ball, I kept 50% intact, and then I came in and cranked on this thing after I've just repotted it, and it's sitting here moving around, and that 50% intact root ball, I don't know that that thing stays intact. I don't know that you keep that tree immobile, right? If a tree is moving, it's dying. Styling to this degree after repotting and reducing the root mat, you know, it's just like I would say you did go too far from the common knowledge that a low water mobility tree cannot handle that type of agitation. Now, balance water and oxygen, nothing to do but learn from the scenario, and you may get away with this. And if you get away with it, here's what I would say don't take it as now I can do that, take it as I got super freaking lucky because Ryan Neal, a bone tie professional, doesn't even do this. Not because I haven't tried. Trust me, I have tried a lot. It hasn't worked out for me well. The first year back from Japan, I repotted 12 Telperian Scots pine. Thought, these are field-grown trees, no big deal. They've got plenty of strength. Styled every one of them. One of the 12 survived, okay? I tried it again on some different pines, on some Yamadori, like, you know, I've tried, a little, I've tried everything. I've learned hard from my mistakes. It's what's built me into what I am. I'm telling you, one in a hundred are gonna turn out well if we take this approach. If you get away with it, you dodged a bullet. It's not the thing to do. Let's not do that in the future. Hey, we indulged. I hope it felt good. Cross our fingers, balance of water and oxygen is what we got, okay? All right, moving on from that, okay? <sighs> I, 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 I like the deadwood at the base of this tree, okay? I like the deadwood at the base of this tree. The deadwood at the base of this tree is not the value of this tree. And this is where we've got to objectively separate ourselves from what we like to, from what we like, we have to separate what we like from what makes this tree special, okay? The deadwood is a sign of age. The deadwood is on a side of the tree that when I look at this, the trunk looks narrow, could just be some photo imaging issues because this is foreground and this is background, but it does look like there's a disproportion potentially. It looks like this tree comes extremely far towards us, which when I look at this, and I'm assuming that your front is right here, this is like, boom, right at us, okay? Um, and when I look, just watch what happens here. Yes, I see it and I love it. Oh my gosh. The base over here is better. The trunk movement through here is better. And the way that your apex, this is, this is a lodgepole pine as a bone size subject, crushed by snow, uh, contorted and bent. This is interesting. Now I'm adding these to add yeah, drama. Let me, let, let me not do that. Okay, let me go here, okay? I think this is your treat. To be honest with you, now again, if on the other side, that deadwood base, the trunk, there's not the drama that I see here, then okay, so be it. But I still think in this design, this cannot be your apex. It cannot, because this contorted bend needs to mean something in the design. These branches dropping down across the front of the tree, you may take those off in the future, I totally respect that. I still don't see this being your best movement. I'm not sure that I see this being your best base. I am sure that I have a super solid base. I am sure that I see a tremendously greater degree of changes of angle spaces and planes. Let me get back out of this. Let me get to that unobstructed, okay? Different angle spaces and planes here and I think when you start to look at this, if you tighten this, not now, over the course of time, 
okay? And you bring this here and you drop the kids off at school and you have your apex here and you have this piece here. And let me just, uh, let me just go ahead and not quite go that route because I wanna keep that apex off center. So I'm gonna keep it maybe into here. Okay, and I'm gonna take this, and, and let, me, let, me just, let me just take this a step further. What if your apex comes back into here? Ooh, uh-oh, 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 okay. And then maybe we keep one of these here. Dangly long lodgepole branch, I love that. Okay, and maybe this piece right here, instead of just going on this kind of passive, not snow-loaded branch, maybe we come here, and then we drop back down and maybe these get dropped off at school and we have a pad there and we have a pad there and we have a pad there. Now we're starting to talk about some funky time, right? Now we're starting to talk about some fun and we could have some of these branches, you know, as gin, uh, we could use a piece here for our apex and we could even bring this up as a sub pad apex or something, right? Like, I think this is where your tree is at. I think this is where the magic of this material is. I think this is where your better base is. I think this is where your movement is. Better base, better movement, or the special feature. Special feature lost this time. Now maybe there's an accommodation. Maybe you can utilize the other front to bring in some of these design concepts. But I find this to be far more engaging and a tree that sets you up for a better future product uh, than the other portion of the design. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt. Let's first make sure that this thing survives the battle that it's just been through. We know that if it does, we dodged a bullet. I feel like I've lectured you firmly enough, but I do like, uh, I, I like the ambition of the design. I like that you went for it in terms of the styling. It reminds me very much of the Literati Lodgepole uh, that we did from a very straight piece on Mirai Live long ago that now sits in the square J cross. Uh, I'm a fan of what you're doing here, and uh, let's hope for the best with this tree, all right? And with the change of clothing, we continue. Josh S, number 19, hello, Ryan and team. Looking forward to a great spring. As I mentioned in the last post, the app has really helped me map out my seasonal work. I'm assuming that you've now downloaded the Broadleaf calendar and you are deep in it, pro content coming very, very soon. Keep an eye out for uh, new academy courses as well as finally getting into some sub-genre sub content on the calendars, which are gonna be super, you guys are gonna be psyched. Anyways, uh, slow and steady wins the race. Species, Cedrus Atlantica, time and training, four years, last scope, June of 2023, wiring and light pruning, location, Denver. No issues, questions. I purchased this tree from a nursery and performed an initial styling back in 2020. Since then, I've largely kept the style the same. Naively, I thought the trunk would thicken in the pot, but as I've progressed in my bonsai journey, I've realized these trees grow slowly. Yes, and the trunk will probably not get much larger. Not true, but we'll talk about it. So I'm wondering if I should consider a more elegant design or maybe something else. The point is I'm kind of falling out of love with this one and I'm wondering what else I might do to move it forward. Thanks in advance. Okay, so here's the deal. Because we water and fertilize so aggressively, even a tree in a bonsai container's trunk will thicken, branches will thicken, wounds will heal, foliar mass will expand, etc. cetera. Uh, especially as you get denser and denser pad formation in the refinement model, you'll be shocked at how rapidly things thicken because you have an abnormal quantity of ramification and foyer mass per square inch of that tree far outside of the realm of what that tree could do naturally in the native environment. And that is where we do see thickening ramp up the more that we refine a tree. In fact, as we show white pine, 30 years into bonsai cultivation will thicken far faster than that juvenile growth in the field. So just something to keep in mind in case that changes where you're at with this. Now, when we fall out of love, naturally, we have to, that's our indication it's time to change. You have a fairly interesting, you know, scaled and proportional blue atlas cedar here, but when we start to talk about cedrus, they have a very unique uh, character and quality of growth, this up and out, and then they typically go up again, right? And so when you start to see these branches coming off here, uh, there's multiple ways that we could sort of handle this, but you could broaden this canopy here and sort of have this kind of a vibe here, which starts to get you into this 
pad formation where you have these tiers that are existing at these different levels, right? And this is very, very seedrous in terms of its occurrence to have this kind of branching structure. And you see some of that naturally occurring already. You've got a, a, a multi apice form. I would certainly pull this maybe uh, slightly towards the front and start to work with the interaction of this branch with that apical region. Raising this creates the space for that. That is one opportunity, okay? Here's another opportunity. You don't have to do that, right? You saw the Literati uh, nursery stock Atlas Cedar. You need to put movement into this trunk if you're gonna actually capture a more elegant form. This is relatively straight, so let's just put a little bit of wibble wobble into that, and now I can start to drop the kids off at school, create my pads here, and I want these branches to be dropped off at these corners to have these up and out kind of feelings and temptations and situations, and this secondary trunk can kind of come out into here and have a similar vibe, and I think you have an entirely different tree, but if you don't change that primary line, I think it's gonna be tough for you to break through uh, a little bit of the fatigue that you're feeling with this tree as your bonsai process has progressed. Now you're seeing new things, having advanced and looked at this tree a long time. You fall out of love, you've gotta do something to fall back in love, and that's generally your indication it's time to go to work, okay? All right, Jan, or Jan. Hey, Ryan and Mariah crew, probably a Juniperus chinensis. Time and training, no idea, but probably more than seven. You just take a look at this. Okay, I see, I see. Uh, last scope of work <coughs> performed and when? Not much in the past five years. I just ginned a dead branch. Okay, uh, location, Yorktown, Virginia. I'm going to say your name is Jan then, zone eight. Uh, concerns with the tree, what to do next, when to do it, and design ideas. Hi, Ryan. I was just given this tree by a friend who was moving and quitting the hobby. He tried to train it as a cascade. However, he had very little knowledge and did not dare repot it. He told me it was planted in a mix of sand, compost, and fine grit. Okay taking it old school. It desperately needs repotting and styling. The branches appear very long and not very well developed. There's some minor back budding on some of them. What I need help with is the best time to repot. How much root can I safely take off and the type and size of the pot to transfer it in? Can I expect more back budding when I prune branches and how to prune? Lastly, what is your thought about styling the plant? Any other thoughts and critiques are always welcome. Third photo is the presumed front. The first is the other side and the second one is from higher up. The fourth is a full frontal. The back does not seem very interesting to me. Thanks a bunch. P.S. Love the first greenhouse session, Jan Bride. Thanks, Jan. Uh, we got more of those coming. Probably uh, need to get that large work out of the way in the workshop session, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so uh, third photo is the presumed front. Ah, I, okay. Maybe, maybe, and I could see that. Now let's just go ahead and, yeah. Let's take a look at this third front. So the entirety of this tree, okay, we say maybe this is the best base. I think you're gonna learn a lot when you repot this tree. I would encourage you to repot it first and not prune it, okay? Not prune it, not wire it, just repot it into the angle that you're thinking. I think you can do a 50% root reduction, which you're gonna leave the central core of roots uh, intact right here, okay? And you're gonna reduce from these greatest limitations, which are these exterior locations, once you get into a, a reasonable size of root mass, which again, I think a 50% reduction is necessary. I want you to take off some of this stuff at the bottom. I want you to establish this planting angle by the flat bottom that you create in that reduction, holding the angle of your new front, okay? And then I want you to go ahead and anchor this firmly into a container at the new angle that you hope to design this tree at, because we're going to come back to this in the early portion of fall, or if the tree needs the fall to rebuild its strength, maybe spring of next year, okay? Now, when we see this going to the back, obviously, if this is going to be our front in image number three, which I can support, we need this piece coming back into the front. You want to bring that back towards the viewer, okay? That has the ability to maybe be manipulated like so, which gives you the ability to use these branches here. And now all of a sudden this is dropping down into this cascade. I'm gonna bend this down in here, right at this junction. I'm gonna bring that piece back up and then I'm gonna sort of flare that out into here. Where I bring that back up, I'm gonna leave this piece down here and now we start to have multiple pads 
that create a really interesting cascading form here, okay? So when we start to think about this, we've got to arm ourselves with the capacity to engage the viewer, pick the angle, let the tree recover in the form of juniper. Strength comes from the foliar mass. If we take that off and then repot, it can't regenerate its root mass. All things to consider, Jan. Uh, good luck with it. And once you've done one of the operations, come on back to us. Let's take a look at what you did, okay? Curtis Sims, Satsuki Azalea. Let me just take a look here. Okay, I see what you got. You're going for a twofer here, Curtis. I, I, I see you. Owned for four years, last scope performed, light pruning post flower 2023 in the south of England. Issues soil percolation. This show he Azalea needs repotting this year. The soil around the base is very decomposed and has lost water percolation. My question is how can I clear that out when Azalea roots are so fine and shouldn't be bare rooted? I've watched the Peter Warren stream, but sure not, but still not sure on the best way to approach this. What would you do? Bonus pick of the juniper you looked at last time after its repot. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, when you are dealing with a heavily decomposed root mass, you've, you, you, although azaleas have this nuance, okay, come back to your basics, all right? We're gonna take off the, the matted roots on the wall. We're gonna take off uh, the bottom matted roots that exist if, they are, if there are matted roots, which azaleas typically don't push roots all the way to the bottom. They, they don't like wet feet. Um, and then we're gonna take away very gently and, and always combing radially trying to take care of the woody roots in here. We're gonna take all of this decomposed organic debris off and we're hoping to get down to intact particle sizes which should exist somewhere below this mucky soil surface okay and when once you get into it if you hit black patches you're going to go ahead and you're going to clean the soil out of those black patches but if you have any patches of good solid intact canuma with healthy fine roots leave those as is if the whole thing is black then we say listen i can't bear root but i'm going to go pretty heavy on this because i know if i don't make the change now anything that i leave like that has the chance to atrophy Although I can't bear root, I'm gonna come real close to it. I'm gonna roll the dice and I'm gonna say, listen, kill it or make it a bonsai. Sometimes we have to do that with Satsuki that have been neglected, all right? But I think if you follow your fundamentals, you work that, that surface off, you find those pockets of good roots, which, which they have to be there in order for this tree to have this kind of leaf mass, and we protect those while taking out those black areas, the decomposed organic matter, et cetera. One more repotting cycle. You put it into fresh canuma, you care for it for two years, you come back into that, you'll be able to rectify the rest of those issues. This tree will be radically healthier anyways, and we'll start to see this tree really built, okay? As far as the juniper, nice change here, okay? I like this, I think we're on the right track. Uh, well done, job well done. Keep on moving forward. Let the juniper blow out. Don't try to overmanage it now. That foliage needs to recover for this tree to really evolve. All right? David C. Hello, Ryan and team. Today I bring you the native common juniper I collected in the field many years ago. Junipers communists collected 2013, uh, wired 2020, and repotted at a new angle into this current container. Location is southern Maine. Uh, issues and concerns, deadwood rotting, deteriorating. I cleaned out a lot of the rotting wood, but it still seems like spots are still soft. I haven't applied lime sulfur since doing the clean because I didn't want the smell in the basement. Hoping to do it as it, uh, as it starts to warm up a bit next week. Good idea uh, as a preservative. Really cool tree here, huh? Unbelievable, actually. Okay, uh, photo descriptions, photo one, front of the tree as I originally styled, photo two, back of the tree. The deadwood is starting to hollow out the trunk a bit, plus there's a small live vein coming out of the soil and wrapping around the deadwood, feeding the cascading part of the tree, cool. Uh, photo three, downward onto the current front showing the structure of the cascading part. And photo four, showing the base of the tree and the uh, kind uh, of the cascading branches. The tree is currently a bit leggy and really hard to take pictures that show the structure of the tree. It is a tree for whatever reason. I failed to come back to, to do the maintenance uh, work. I have been reducing the number of trees in my collection as the quality of my trees has improved since joining Mirai. Very cool. Although. For every few trees I move out, I seem to bring in a couple more of higher quality. I guess it is just a vicious circle. Thanks for all you and your team do for us. Absolutely appreciate the support, David. Uh, and it is a vicious cycle. It's called an addiction. Addiction uh, have treatment uh, groups and support groups for a reason. Nobody has started a bonsai addiction circle yet. Maybe that will be Mirai's uh, coup de gras after, you know, 
50 years of being a bonsai professional, helping people separate from bonsai in the latter portion of their life. Okay, here's what I gotta say. You know, when I look at image number one, this straight section is a deal breaker for me. There may be more dimension in the tree than I can see here, but I'm not seeing it and the camera does not lie. The two dimensions is tough. And when I look at the back, I say, okay, well that actually is still really straight. I do tend to find the back to be interesting because there's more dead wood uh, than I can see on the front, but it could just be that I can't see the front. And when I look down on that, uh, there's some interesting movement that exists in here. I mean, this is amazing. Look at this. And that's where I started looking here and I say, David, I think this is your front. I actually think this is your front. Now you're probably saying, yeah, but you can't tell that that's coming directly at you. Well, I can because I'm proposing the front be over here. And these things are coming at us and the apex is moving away from us. But when we start to look at that, watch what happens here. Okay, you get live dead interaction here. You got a great base. Look at the movement of the trunk as it comes through here. This comes down, kick this out into this region. Take me out into space, which allows you to utilize these shorter branches. Maybe you bring this up, right, and here, and then we drop back down into here. When you come up, one of those branches becomes your dropping the kids off at school. Okay, that starts to create scale. And then when we start to get into here, gosh, how badly do you wanna just compress this thing here? and have this type of a vibe now starting to form these kinds of branches that complement that semi-cascading or cascading vibe, the compression of that, which may, when we come back to this, require taking some of this deadwood off, putting raffia on this, and folding this back into this region, totally doable. Uh, you've got two great branches here. One of, this one can be the depth branch back in here. This one can be your apex or vice versa, whichever works out structurally sound. But I think that's your tree moving forward. <coughs> And you should have all of the firepower, both built up energy as well as foliar density to achieve that design. I don't feel like that's unrealistic. Let me know how you think about that. If you choose to pursue it, I'd love to see how it turns out. All right. 27, Austin. What do we got, Austin? Uh, Hinoki, not sure of the variety. One and a half years in training. Last scope, wired and styled in uh, October of last year. Cottonwood, Arizona. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Parents live in carefree. Uh, issues, concerns, none at the moment. Question, just a styling critique this week. Goals, repotting the spring, I would like to shoot for the lean in image one. Okay, cool. Uh, a slight wind informed coastal upright. As the design develops, I'll be pushing it in on the viewer's right and elongating on the viewer's left. Great, I love what you're doing here. The first branch lowest on the right is clearly too long, but I'm allowing it to stay and keep the strong base while it recovers from the styling and repotting. Also hoping that some good vigor in that branch will give me the back buds I need to reduce it. There is a gin at the top to reduce the original plant's height. The crazy bend at the shoulder of the new apex is natural and I had to harness it. Okay, uh, this led to a reiteration on the right side and another a little lower on the left. Great, I can't wait to see this. Okay, photo description one, initial reduction of material in 922, a high C, yes, look at this. Uh, number two, sun damage from the summer. Turns out they don't like that much Arizona sun midday. Yeah, feels about right. Hinoki is a very shade tolerant plant. And in fact, shade loving plant, much like a redwood, which needs a lot of protection where you're at. Uh, three, before wiring in 1023. And four, after wiring, uh, absolute minimal foliage was removed. Well, I love this. Um, okay, so, you know, I'm not even mad at this branch back in here and there is, so we're saying, listen, we want to, uh, you want the lean in image one to the left, um, and you're saying a slight wind in form, I'm gonna push in on the viewer's right and elongate on the viewer's left. But I'm looking at this tree and I'm seeing more length on the right side here, okay? So why fight, why fight it? Why not lean, and let me just show you where this planting angle could be. Why not lean to the right, have this branch be here, have these be up and out, but notice in leaning it to the right here that my trunk line comes up and now this piece leaning to the right has a lot of purpose, right? Because it's leaning in this direction. These are already short over here. I love this reiteration right here, right? And we can kind of face that back in that direction. Um, I feel like you have 
all of the makings of a movement, especially with the strength of this base, to the right where you're elongating to the right and you're compressing to the left. I think that's actually far more natural because if I come back here, let me just go like this, and I lean to the right, now you have this arc. See that arc there? That's not pleasurable. But when you start to lean this way, that arc shows that tree moving and then growing towards the sun as opposed to growing here and kind of slumping over. I think you would be best to move to the right. Take it with a grain of salt. I don't want to spoil your inspiration and I don't want to rain on your parade, but the tree is giving you something. So don't try to force it. Let the tree guide the dance. I think the tree wants to move to the right. Your branches are set up, your trunk is set up, your base is set up. I'm going to encourage you hardcore to go in that direction. Whenever you fight a tree, we usually pay the, uh, the consequences, OK? Or suffer the consequences, pay the price. Scott D, Utah Juniper, collected in 2018, repotted for 2022. OK, April of 2022 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. No concerns, ready for initial styling. Great, I'm going to see you very soon, Scott. Hi, Ryan and team. I'm looking to do the initial styling on this Utah Juniper this spring or late summer. After the repot in 22, I did lose about 20% of the foliage, but that stopped, and I have gotten some good growth since then. Interestingly, some of the new growth has been what I believe to be epicormic growth, which maybe indicates the stress from the repot. Given the rather masculine nature of the tree, but considering the leaning angle of the base, I'm considering a compacting tension-based design back to the right from the current front. My two questions are, how would you approach the design and how best to handle the epicormic growth? Wondering if I need to go in stages as I remove some of that clumping growth, question mark. First pick is the current front. Uh, second is the tree from the right. Third is from the back. And four is a close-up of the epicormic growth. Thanks, Scott. Okay, very, very common for Utah Juniper. And in these situations, Scott, I pick my strongest pieces. I certainly don't want to thin down to one or two. I want to leave this is for sure. Uh, it appears this is for sure. And if you have any other really dominant pieces, I try to save three to four in the initial reduction with the notion that I probably will, will reduce down to two or three, but I'll never reduce down to one in that location. Always try to keep the most foliage in that reduction on the most dominant pieces in any of those epicormic growths. Makes total sense when a juniper is stressed as well as when a juniper is responding slash recovering for it to push back from that basal origin. Doesn't uh, concern me at all. Where you have more foliage up here in these areas, you can be a lot more aggressive, especially if you have much more dominant branching. But to keep this alive, you're going to need to keep enough foliar mass, which means being selective in your epicormic reduction. Okay, I love the decision to move to the right. And I actually like that this comes out here, past vertical, boom, boom. And then I think you've got all the mobility you need. Because this is so powerful, compression and then elongation. But here's where I'm going to say, I don't know that tension is where you want to go, because you have more structure up in this area here. If you move this back in this direction, now look at where you get. This is kind of where tension falls apart. Now, you may be able to, to compress and keep it up in this area here and keep it back off of tension. This is how Mr. Kimura used to use tension. And then that tension eventually, as it moved and moved and centered the design, he would go back towards harmonious. I tend to find you move to the left, you come back to the right, and then you finish coming back to the left. Now you have access to some of these branches that start to create the opportunity. You also pull some of these branches, and you start to build this incremental creep towards the right as this piece evolves and matures, and you start to really see this leaning on that to really hold but advancing your degree of asymmetry. You know, whatever this becomes, maybe this is a supporting role, maybe this, you know, is, is a secondary. That's fine. Big apex continuing to guide asymmetry. You've got the anchor root to support the harmonious design. We go one, two, three changes of direction, increases the quality, gives you the ability to represent age over time. And this is really where, with an uninteresting piece of material, tension all day long, but here you have an interesting piece of material that represents age and has the basal stability to anchor asymmetry. Set yourself up for 
15 years in the future of being able to evolve and improve this design in an asymmetrically increasingly older fashion by what you do now with your structural setting. That would be my advice. Uh, take it with a grain of salt and good luck. I'm excited to see that and I'm also looking forward to working together. Scott, safe travels on your way out to Mirai. Okay, Brandon, hello again Mirai fam. I bring you another ginkgo I acquired from Tom Roberts. Very, very cool, love Tom. I'm gonna go see him here pretty soon. I've had the tree for two years and just recently repotted it into this bluish Sarah Rainer. When repotting, I was really able to examine the roots and found two larger lower ones that needed to be removed, one wrapped around the trunk and the other attached to it. They seemed unsightly and I didn't want them to worsen or continue to dig into the trunk over time. They were relatively larger roots, so do you think that was right in that I was right in this? I realize I'm asking after the fact, but I figured the tree was young and healthy, so now is the best time before going into a bonsai pot. I also use the fast healing cut paste mentioned on one of your streams you mentioned Jonas had at Bonsai tonight. Uh, I'm just going to stop there for a moment. So it's funny, somebody, somebody who was here in class this past week said uh, Jonas uh, did like a breakdown of cut pace and said Ryan Neal likes this, this cut pace, uh, Andrew Robson likes this cut pace, Michael Hagedorn likes this cut pace, you know, and he sells all of them. So it's all good, you know, but like that cut paste was recommended to be my Michael Hagedorn for specifically healing ginkgo. Uh, and I've got a bottle too. I have yet to use it, but we'll probably put it into action when we get back to ginkgo work uh, later this spring. Also, what would be your suggestions for design with this tree? I have some suckers at the base. I was considering removing for a more single trunk design. Would you leave them? There is also an obtuse angled larger branch jutting out from the main trunk line, lower large right branch that seems to detract from the natural flame shape aesthetic. How would you handle this? Thanks again for all your feedback and guidance. As always, it means a lot and has helped tremendously in my bonsai journey. Much love, Brandon. You got it, Brandon. Thanks for the support. Uh, so let's dig into this. Uh, pick one was prior to repot and lower larger root removal. Um, I mean, I feel like any roots that you removed on, listen, you, you absolutely, oh, I see. This is the one that you took off, boom, right here. Yeah, nah, you're fine, you're totally fine. Uh, and it needed to happen. And when a tree is this vigorous and this chock full of roots, that's when you do this kind of reduction, dramatic improvement in the pot that it went into. Uh, I love Sarah Rayner, I love her glazes, I love her pots. Now I would say, you know, as a ginkgo, over the course of time, you may move to a more ovular uh, container just because this probably is gonna be a fairly upright ginkgo, throwing it out there. Okay, pick two and three, front-ish, and pick four, close up of suckers at the base. Okay, I see what you got going on here. So here's what I would do. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go with the straighter and let me just get rid of all of this, okay? Uh, I'm gonna go with the straighter of the two trunks just to maximize my flame shape. I'm gonna be bringing my uh, apical leader up as much as I can. I'm gonna bring these branches off it up and then out up and then out, and I'm gonna be cutting these back to start to form, excuse me, that's too, too broad, to start to form this shape, okay? Now this piece also needs to come up and out. I might shorten it to improve taper, and then wire these pieces up and out, up and out, up and out. And then I'm gonna bring these pieces from depth up and out, paying very close attention. Notice how my lines parallel each other right here. That's important for ginkgo because if I go like this, now I have that terrible circular branching junction. You wanna be utilizing these correctly. Okay, any of these smaller guys, I'm gonna go up and out. And this piece here, even though it might come out, I'm gonna go up and out. I'm gonna use these branches up and out, up and out, up and out. Okay, and this is really how I'm gonna be st setting my ginkgo up for success because now you start to see the flame shape that we aspire to, right? And that's really where harnessing the capacity of ginkgo as we ramify it, as we improve it, as we get it to a better and better state uh, of health and development and ramification, you want to set the bones to give you success right here, okay? And you have a great tree, great interesting ginkgo to, to get it started. Okay, I would keep the bigger of these two, I would get rid of these small things, right? Who knows if you'll use it, but I would put wire on it. And if this starts to ramify and you have another flame shape piece here that fits in the foreground because this is in the background and occupies this tremendous amount of negative space, that will both help bulk up the trunk as well as give you some sort of 
of lower branching, evolution, ramification, et cetera. Don't, uh, don't get rid of those things. I think you're wise to have saved them, and I would save the strongest one because it isn't a root sucker. It's coming from up uh, at the crown of the tree above the root base. We can turn that into a sub trunk and, and not feel guilty about it, okay? Love you guys. Thanks for posting, and uh, thanks for the support. The app now expandeth. We are in the process of growing it and uh, get excited because you're going to benefit. All right? Love you guys. Mwah.